The all-white jury debates the charges less than eight minutes per man and finds each guilty. The judge sentences all 12 to death. As far as Arkansas is concerned, the case is closed. But for Scipio Africanus Jones, an African-American Little Rock attorney, the case is far from closed. As far as he is concerned, the trial is a lynching that wears the mask of law. Born in slavery, Jones was driven to succeed in life. He worked his way through college, studied law, and eventually became Little Rock's most prominent black lawyer. Jones came into his manhood at a time when opportunities still existed for black people in Arkansas. In the late 19th century, blacks held political office, became doctors and lawyers, voted, owned property, built churches, and organized women's clubs and fraternal groups. By 1919, although segregation is deeply entrenched in Arkansas, Scipio Jones is determined to save the 12 condemned farmers from execution. But unknown to Jones, Walter White, the assistant secretary of the NAACP and its chief investigator of lynchings, is already on the case. Back in New York, Walter White recruits Colonel George Murphy, a lawyer from Little Rock, to represent the condemned men. He is a white Southerner, a Confederate war hero, a first-rate lawyer, and sympathetic to the defendants. Jones agrees to work with Murphy. Jones and Murphy immediately head to Helena, Arkansas, where racial tensions are still as volatile as gas fumes. What I find so extraordinary about Scipio Africanus Jones is his courage, his willingness to go to Helena knowing that his life was always at risk as soon as he crossed the county line. Knowing he's surrounded by men hoping for the chance to kill him, Jones sleeps in a different house each night. By day, he and Murphy prepare a motion for a new trial. They charge that the presence of the mob and the use of torture made it impossible for the defendants to have a fair trial. Jones gathers testimony from a number of tenant farmers, including Alf Banks. I was frequently whipped and also put in an electric chair and shocked and strangling drugs would be put in my nose to make me tell that others had killed or shot at white people and to force me to testify against them. The trial judge denies their motion. Jones and Murphy appeal to the Arkansas Supreme Court. The court orders a new trial for six of the defendants on technical grounds, but allows the death sentences to stand for the other six. The first six are sentenced to death again, but again, the appeals court overturns the verdict. When Murphy dies shortly after the trial, the fate of all 12 men is left in the hands of Scipio Jones and Murphy's partner, Edgar McKinney. Jones faces an immediate crisis. Six of the men are only days away from execution. There seems no hope. Frank Moore, one of the six, watches prison carpenters build their coffins in front of their cells. They showed us our coffins and laughed and said that's where we'll be resting tomorrow night. But we had faith in our lawyer and said, no, that won't happen. Jones needs four weeks' time in order to appeal the case in the federal courts, and he knows that the Arkansas Supreme Court will not stop the executions. With hours left before the men are to die, Jones and McKinney surprise everyone by appealing for and obtaining a delay of execution from Chancery Court. Some folks perhaps would have even questioned the wisdom of Mr. Jones filing a petition in the Chancery Court, which had no jurisdiction. Ultimately, and practically speaking, it turned out to be a brilliant move by Mr. Jones because he did secure a delay of the execution, uh, which uh, bought him and his, uh, uh, his clients time to pursue more appropriate appeals. 
Several weeks later, the Arkansas Supreme Court removes the stay. But Jones has gained the time he needs to file his appeal in the federal district court. The case is known as Moore versus Dempsey. Jones's strategy saves the men's lives. But for how long? The NAACP now brings in Moorefield Story, a constitutional lawyer and president of the NAACP to work with Jones. They feel their strongest argument is that the presence of a mob surrounding the court made it impossible for the defendants to receive a fair trial. Story and Jones are concerned that the court will reject their appeal as it has already done in a similar case. In 1913, a Georgia mob demanded that a jury find Leo Frank, a Jewish manager of a clothing factory, guilty of murdering a young woman worker at the plant. Frank was innocent, but the judge and jury, intimidated by the mob, convicted him, and Frank was sentenced to death. The United States Supreme Court refused to intervene, and Frank was ultimately lynched. But there was a dissenting voice, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. Jones hopes that Justice Holmes can convince his colleagues to reverse that decision. On February 19, 1923, the Supreme Court announces its decision, Justice Holmes speaking for the majority. If the whole case is a mask, that counsel, jury, and judge were swept to the fatal end by an irresistible tide of public passion, and the state courts refused to correct the wrong, then nothing can prevent this court from securing to the petitioners their constitutional rights. The Supreme Court orders the case back to the federal district courts for further review. Jones immediately seizes the opportunity. He pressures the states to release everyone imprisoned in the case. The state surrenders. By 1925, everyone is released. Jones's victory in Moore versus Dempsey did not compensate for the deaths at Elaine, but it did help prevent future deaths. For the first time in American history, the Supreme Court handed down a verdict favoring black defendants in a criminal case. For the next 50 years, the NAACP will build on Moore versus Dempsey to win other major victories in the Supreme Court that eventually will help end legal segregation. Although Jones may be little known today, his legacy remains as one of the first black lawyers to challenge Southern legal injustice and win. No finer tribute has been given him than that written almost 80 years ago in the African American newspaper, the Arkansas Survey. Mr. Jones went to Helena and took charge of the case when Helena was a seething cauldron of hate and the least indiscretion meant death. For four years, he traveled and investigated and pled until the 13th of January, when Governor McRae opened the prison gates to the last of the rioters. All hail Jones. Praise him for his knowledge of the law, his nerve, and his sagacity. He will receive little glory, but it is the great state of Arkansas which is the real beneficiary of his service. And the people of America as well.